Hello and welcome. My name is Alanis Morissette, and my guest today is Wendy Maltz. Wendy's an American sex therapist, psychotherapist, author, and educator, and clinical social worker. Wendy specializes in the sexual repercussions of sexual abuse, understanding women's sexual fantasies, treating pornography-related problems, and promoting healthy sexuality. She's written several books, some of which are The Sexual Healing Journey, A Guide to Survivors of Sexual Abuse, Private Thoughts, Incest and Sexuality, Intimate Kisses, and has co-authored, along with her husband Larry Maltz, the book The Porn Trap. Very inspired to have Wendy join me today on the show. So welcome, Wendy Maltz, to the show. So excited to be having this conversation with you. It's such a sacred one and has such potential for healing on a very deep level in a way that is often not talked about in culture in general. So I thank you for your stepping up and having this beautiful conversation with me, a very brave one. I'm very happy to be here, Alanis. Bless you. Yes, I have a lot of respect for you and your quest to really do personal growth work and to, um, you know, your bravery in talking (laughs) about sexuality. And, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about relationship issues, but uh, they skip over this. And it's so important now, especially nowadays. People are very confused. Very confused about the effects of having experienced sexual abuse at any point in our lives. And then also, it's just such a taboo subject still after all this time, and yet it has the potential to be such an empowering, gorgeously pervasive, powerful element to our lives and to our connection and to our setting boundaries and and self-definition. So I really, I do value it so much. And on a personal side of things, I myself have experienced a handful of different versions of sexual abuse in my past. In the context of our conversation, I likely won't get into many details, and I'll save that for... um, my book that I'm writing where it's appropriate and I think it'll be of service. Of course, I'll share stories that are, that are helpful to people. And at the same time, I'll, I'll, I'll reference it. But I just wanted to start by diving into sort of a broad stroke of if you were to take a guess or you might have empirical evidence around this, what percentage of people in general do you think are survivals, both people who are willing to answer yes and check the yes box in questionnaires, as well as people who, who still believe it to be important to be kept as a secret? Well, the research shows that it's about one in three females And about one in five or six males have been sexually abused, well, or are sexually abused in their lifetime. You know, a lot of, in terms of getting research, a lot depends on what you define as sexual abuse. It used to be just penetration, Mm -hmm. sex, but then that's been expanded to molestation and other forms of inappropriate touch and um, and voyeurism and that kind of for, thing. Yeah, so it's it's really there's a lot of forms, uh, even obscene phone calls. Of course, you don't get those now because you have you can everyone can out. trace you. <laughs> you can trace you, right? But yes. that used to be a big thing when uh, you know when I was younger. Yeah, you know when you're violated sexually. So if you look at it on a very broad level like that, probably. Everyone's experienced some form of having their sexuality attempted to be controlled or controlled by somebody else. Yeah, th- that violation in general. It could be the emotional aspect of things, too, because there's mm-hmm. there's the, the physical, sexual, and then there's the emotional, intellectual part of it, too, which can be equally yes. violating, right? Exactly. If uh, children watch a father grabbing the mother at the breakfast table and um, she's very uncomfortable and he's touching her, let's say touching her chest or something, that can be, and doing that on a regular basis in a way where she feels uh, you can just see her discomfort, Mm -hmm. you know, that can be a form of sexual abuse too. Mm. It's those, those experiences where sex is used as a form of having power and control dominating someone else or exploiting someone else. Yeah, there's so many false ideas that you write about and speak about and that I've come to learn over the years too about about sex. You know, one of them is that sex can be used as as a commodity and it can be exploited. The other one 
is that somehow this sexual energy is beyond someone's control and, and not containable somehow. And I've grown to um, respect deeply, in my case, being heterosexual, just really respecting men who who have the capacity to be in charge of their own dimmer switch, for lack of a better metaphor, as opposed to just saying, hey, this is beyond my, my ability to control. And so whether you're suffering or not is inconsequential to me. So that idea that sex is not containable is one of the false ideas. Exactly. And I think it's a cop out and an excuse for bad behavior. Yes. When people say that. Yeah. And and it might be a myth that's also kind of perpetrated in our society. So it's not crazy that someone thinks that way, that their sexuality is out of control. And there's a disempowering element to that, too, because if we were taught as young people that it's absolutely within our control and that we we have our hand on that switch, really, because it, it is a continuum. I, I also love, as part of your teaching, the idea that touch in general is on a continuum and that on the far left is the non-sexual touch that often moms have with their babies or that mm-hmm. we have with each other when we're being very playful and non-sexual, and that the continuum goes all the way to the right where it's full-blown sexuality, and that In an ideal world, you would slowly take baby steps along this continuum as as your maturation happened. Is there an age or point at which you think the journey toward the more sexual aspect of things would be appropriate? Are there any findings on that in your experience? Well, I think that biologically there are a lot of hormones that kick in at puberty and they can create sexual dreams and sexual sensations and responses that are just natural. It's the blooming of sexuality for a human being. And so I think that's a point. But, you know, in terms of things like self-exploration and self-touch, the Research shows that that starts at a very early age. There can even be some of that in utero, and it's just like a kind of getting to know one's body. It's precious. Um, yeah. It's precious. I know you have a little boy, but you know I don't know if you've experienced this, where little babies and children will just feel your face, pull on your lips, you know, <laughs> yes. grab, grab your just hair. Just this morning. <laughs> explore all these parts and if they're nursing you know they do more you know and it's natural with part of that and that's all important preparation and learning and relational learning around healthy touch and self-awareness like you said it's best when it unfolds naturally in a way slowly slowly when a, a way that's within a person's control this is where so much of this sexual media we have going on now kids have access to is really throwing a wrench in that uh, that hypersexualization you mean in, in music oh. videos or otherwise yeah and it, it being couched as um feminism or, or it's in this sexually empowered element and i'm just like how is this not falling into the category of it being a currency that we're now exploiting in our own selves and in, in a preemptive move because we anticipate we're exploited for it anyway and that that's normal we'll exploit our own selves and have it really reduce us, one-dimensionalize us, certainly as women and men too, in a lot of ways, Yeah, that we're just sexual beings as opposed to being these multitudinous, you know, rich creatures. For children, you know, when they see sexual media and they go, what's that? You know, like even if they pick up a cell phone and hit a switch and all of a sudden see somebody wiggling, you know, in yeah. a seductive dance or straight out pornography mm-hmm. that can hyper arouse and uh, the create early associations that don't help them in terms of this unfolding of their sexuality in a way that feels safe comfortable and can help them to be able to connect with somebody down the road in terms of in a love relationship. For us with our son, my husband and I, as best as we can, we just sort of normalize all the body parts too, because I think one Mm -hmm. of the fallout elements of sexual abuse or being exposed, I mean, would you call exposure of a young child to media that's hypersexualized a version of sexual abuse? Yes. Okay. So, so if that's the case, then if a child is exposed to that, it's so easy for culture to, you know, ascribe certain qualities to body parts as good or bad penises, little vaginas, whatever it is in a tiny creature, even the words themselves. We're taught to call our genitals all these different words because of our fear of what? Our fear of 
of this so-called uncontrollable sexual energy or current? Why is it, do you think, that so many of us can't even say the word penis or vagina or anus or whatever it is? Is it because of how abused that we've been or is it because we're terrified of, of the natural impulse of sexuality? We think mm-hmm. it's not controllable. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we live in a very skitzy kind of culture in terms of sexuality because we're bombarded with all these images and words that are slang terms all the time. I think kids might even know the slang terms before they even learn the accurate term for Mm -hmm. some of these body parts. That changes. It's a game changer there. So what my husband and I have have attempted to do is really just neutralize all the body parts. You know, if it's your penis or your shoulder or your eyelids or your anus or your gluteus maximus, you know, like we just name it things and it's all exciting and it's all body parts and they all have different functions. And some of the functions, we don't really get into the details of it because it's not age appropriate. And Alanis, you know, I think what you're doing with your son is critically important and that parents nowadays need to get on the ball and be doing that in terms of getting there first with appropriate language, getting there first with positive messages, with this idea that their bodies belong to them, Mm. that they have private special places in their body that are capable of good sensations, and that also that they live in a culture where there are strange things they might see and some it might stir up some feelings and to that you're there to talk Pro- with process them about it, with it them. to yeah. process it mm-hmm. and this may need to start because of the very high amount of sexually explicit material this may need to start very early you know preschoolish age mm-hmm. talking about body parts as the parts of the body that are underneath your swimsuit <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's, and that's one way or whatever. You yeah, know, or the calling them parts. and and sometimes even private is a lovely enough word, I suppose. Even just sacred parts or special yes. parts or parts that you yes. share with people that you're, yeah. you know, in a relationship with where there's deep love and or you you know to the degree that you believe that it's in a sanctified yeah. relationship of commitment or. You know, and is there anything that you would recommend people checking out or reading around that in terms of parents getting a general sense of what to introduce and when? Well. I actually think that there are some very good sexual education books, and I often have gone to Planned Parenthood for their lists. They keep wonderful lists, and some public libraries do too, of the latest resources. So you can ask your librarian or a sex educator through clinics, and your pediatrician probably would know too. There's a, a very touching book, is a classic, that talks about private body parts and where do I come from? What's happening mm. to me? You know, those yeah, are I love cla- those. classics. Yeah. Your body belongs to you. And some of these we can write at the resource list at the end of this as well. So, yes. so um, I can get that list from you and we can just have it a- as a link. Actually, my husband's cousin is Lori Britton, who wrote the book, It's My Body, that is an international classic for kids and teaching kids about healthy body perspectives. It's so great to neutralize it and to normalize it and to really share that and teach them that all these body parts are of equal value. Yeah, but the important thing, I think that piece about this is something special for you and that if there's anything uncomfortable, anybody says things or any uncomfortable touch or let's talk about it because just like there are foods that are not great to get into because Mm -hmm. They're foods that don't give you energy and they can slow your body down and weaken you, harm your teeth and, you know, all these things. We need to be aware that there's a lot of materials out there that they will come in contact with and some of those are good to stay away from. You're basically teaching them boundaries with their bodies, with their sexuality, Mm -hmm. with their feelings, incoming and outgoing boundaries. And that's Mm -hmm. one of the big aspects of healing too, right? The idea of being able to establish these boundaries and to speak to one of the false ideas that is also quite pervasive with regards to boundaries is that the idea 
that sexuality has, has only one person benefiting. This has been a big message that certainly I took in as a young person, that somehow, and this is certainly in the culture of patriarchy, but also mm-hmm. within homosexual relationships too, that somehow, mm-hmm. especially if there was a childhood where there was narcissism prevalent, and I was definitely a co-narcissist for a long time doing a lot of work around that, but sensing that with sexuality that somehow it was about pleasing and that even my communicating my own pleasure was for the other versus just my having healthy narcissism and my enjoying my own pleasure and experiencing the pleasure of someone across from me and how lovely. It's sort of turned around in, in the false idea of this that there's a winner and a loser somehow. Yeah, a dominator and a, somebody who's submissive. Mm-hmm. And that's very prevalent in today's pornography and a lot of the media and movies everywhere i mean that's yeah so many movies i can think of off the top of my head where the hot scene is where one's hyper passive and thrown up against the wall and and so what do you feel or think about that the idea of what's the healthy version if you were to conjure that for a second well i think that the healthy version is where you have people who are respecting each other and have uh, consent, affirmative consent, and the ongoing consent with what they're engaging in. They have mutual trust and, and an environment of safety. And I think equality in a power dynamic is very important. I mean, people can, you can play games, you know, you can play at things of somebody being the uh, aggressor in a sexual experience. There needs to be an overall feeling that both people have, that there's a lot of mutual respect and both people are honored and have the right to say no and uh, to change out what they're doing together. Yeah, if something doesn't work for them, that there's an egalitarianism on a worth level too, right? Yeah, and the sexual feeling coming from, like if you imagine a couple dancing together and swaying together and the movement of their bodies stimulates their genitals and they both become aroused from that and they're kind of they start kissing and naturally they start feeling like they swirl up this energy through their engagement with each other through their being present with each other and feeling it's kind of a beloved type of orientation to sexual pleasure and enjoyment and i think that kind of sexual connection is so important if you want to experience a lasting sexual attraction and deep sexual satisfaction in a long-term relationship as we get older you can't put on the uh, the strip the French the French made outfit isn't working for you and Larry anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know, in a nice, comfortable T-shirt <laughs> or no, that's you know, that's the new sexy. <laughs> a, a towel drying after the shower, you know, whatever. But it's like when you come from a place of heart, sex is ageless, and that sexual energy can get swirled up. But if we condition ourselves to only be aroused to this power dynamic, ooh, I'm going to get some, or I'm going to please the other person, you know. Mm -hmm. I I mean, not that pleasing is a great thing to do. No, it's lovely, yeah. Both both initiating and pleasing are great, but if if you're stuck stuck, in that, yeah, and that can get old fast. And people can feel disrespected or exploited or demeaned and in some way, and it just becomes not fun and they can disrespect their partner and then not want to engage sexually with the partner. It can be be a roadblock or or a a stopping. Sorry, you were going to say something. I can't tell you how many couples in my practice, you know, I've practiced for 40 years as a sex and relationship therapist, but how many times it was that the low sex desire seemed directly related to people losing respect for the their rigidity partner. the rigidity of the dynamic too like yeah, oh you can exactly. only be the one in control and i can only be submissive and and this yeah. isn't so exciting anymore there's less of a dance really and a, less yeah. of a dance of considering the wholeness of both people too right because there are days yeah. where you might feel more initiative taking and there are days you might feel happily more passive and that version of being stuck in these rigid roles doesn't leave room for the full breadth of our humanity, really. I think sex is, is infinite. And I think sexual interest and arousal and stimulation can come from many things. It can come from inspiration from nature, uh, music, 
art, a conversation on the couch, looking at each other's eyes, holding hands, excitement about something together that you've done, from cleaning the garage together finally when you've been wanting to do it for years. <laughs> That's so hot, you Wendy. Know, I know, that is so hot, <laughs> but you can't imagine. <laughs> no, I, I have yeah, it too you... when, when my husband mirrors me. Like if he, if he tells me things about me that are, sometimes are decidedly have, you know, have nothing to do with my sexuality, if he says how he sees me being in the world. I'll, it's just super oh, hot. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, get oh. over here. Yeah. When your partner's your biggest champion, yeah. you just go, wow, you know. And also in areas where maybe I didn't have certain things during my own stages of development, when he's equipped and empowered with the information of what touches my heart, mm -hmm. he can get right to me on so many levels, <laughs> physically uh, and emotionally and otherwise, spiritually, by just saying the perfectly well-placed thing. So my question then around associations and couplings and triggers even are with sexual fantasies, what would you recommend for people if their sexual fantasies and what arouses them or what turns them on is something that is associated with abuse or associated with with something that's not healthy for them. I have a lot of experience personally oh. when I was younger and then also a lot of friends who basically say it's hard for me to get turned on unless there's something inherently wrong with the dynamic. What would you say to that? Yeah, that's often a repercussion from sexual abuse and the confusion it causes and the early associations with arousal, early conditioning. And I think it can be attempts to try and figure out or gain some type of power over that abuse dynamic by turning something painful maybe into something pleasurable. It can be like a neurotic nightmare, though, where it's playing out over and over on kind of a stuck loop, the abuse, because a person hasn't taken time to really process their feelings from what happened to them in the past. Yeah. You know, when you use sexual fantasies for arousal, they can, and abuse fantasies, can, there can be a lot of tension. It can, there's, if they can be high conflict mm -hmm. kind of fantasies. Very dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. And that sometimes people feel so deadened. They sexually that those fantasies they they turn to those or those what that's what pops up i think you need to have a lot of self compassion and self love with those fantasies and i've i'll be candid i suffered from some of those myself as a survivor of sexual abuse mm -hmm. and that that's a lot what motivated me to do research on sexual fantasy and and work with Susie boss to on that book the uh, private thoughts it has a whole chapter on how to heal unwanted sexual fantasies mm. Before it co becomes compulsive or something can only be a turn on if it's illicit or, you know, somehow a terrible thing or dramatic or in what I've learned in my own personal experience, it can be a slippery slope into the actings out of sexual addiction, too. You know, I've seen a lot of men, some, yeah. some even in the public eye on television shows, extolling the glee and the high five chest bump element of having been molested by their babysitters when they were 12 or 10 or 9 and I do see a little bit of a difference of how men can appropriate and how men can take sexual abuse experiences and, and attempt to flip them around and make it seem like this is some hot thing that started my sexual conquest journey really early. I see women having a tendency to do less of that. Yeah, I think that's a reaction, though, a reaction right. formation. It's not a genuine feeling good about themselves. That's sort of like a, you know, that high... That Lemons into lemonade. Bumps. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think it's like a deep healing that it represents. I think it's no. more like a sort of like, I'm not going to be a victim to this and right. see, I'm going to make this out into something that was good for me that I really benefited from. Right. But th there may still be a lot of confusion and pain because of it. And a robbery may have occurred in terms of them being able to feel more on top of their sexuality and ha having it unfold in a way that felt connective, yeah, mm -hmm. to them, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the element of wanting to turn something painful into, into a boon for them, I totally, I very much appreciate yeah. that. Oh, or being drawn to certain kinds of fantasies. I think it's really important for all of us in our culture to really ask ourselves, am I cultivating my erotic imagination in ways that are consistent with 
my values and where I want to go with my sexuality, what I want to do with it? Or is there a split? Am I moving? Am I, am I, are my sexual fantasies and my arousal conditioning off on a tangent that really isn't serving me in terms of being able to be more present or connected or have high self-esteem. Mm, that's a big one. You know? The esteem one is so big because, yeah. and, and this is what I see in pop culture with music videos, is people thinking that this hypersexualization is somehow empowering them and raising their self-esteem when I really question that because it is a reduction in a sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so you and Larry, your husband Larry, wrote a book called The Porn Trap, and it begs a question for me around a question that I've heard a lot of people ask, which is, is there such thing as using pornography in a healthy way? Or is the very act of using it as a tool, quote unquote, or, or using it at all, is the very act of reaching out to something like that an indication of some abuse or indication of a challenge around sexuality? Well, pornography, there's it's so many different types of it and so many versions of it. And one person's definition can change from somebody else's, you know. Mm -hmm. So a romance novel might be seen as pornography mm -hmm. and uh, or a certain kind, you know, and then not another. Or a popular um, TV show might be super soft pornographic. You know, it's like it, so it, many TV shows. I'm like, wow, this is soft porn. This is Exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah. And music videos and it could be even be the sports illustrated could be seen it's sort of it's more like what's your relationship with the media has it become a sexual outlet is it defining the way you view sex because pornography is really someone else's sexual fantasy it's someone else's thing pornography we've got to understand that you know if we relate with pornography we're relating with a product Right. Someone else's you know, version of, of what's hot to uh, them. Yeah. yeah. Were we relating with a commercial product that is geared to engage us mm -hmm. and geared to addict us or get us wanting to Hooked. come back and yep. back and back to it? Because that's the free porn. When people get bored with that, they move into the extreme. And that's where people make money is on the more and more extreme sites. They have to add aggression to it, add violence, add inappropriateness to it like incest or to, to make it to make it illicit yeah. you mean to make it something that to make it charge because pornography right. feeds on the, uh, the addictive shock. right yeah which needs the adrenaline rush which comes from shock novelty and it's this more intensity and secrecy and, too i mean that seems to be a, yeah. a big element of and partly the false yeah. ideas and partly the, the addictive hap hit element of pornography or otherwise is that idea of it being secretive, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you say, okay, uh, and the thing is you can start in looking at what's pretty tame porn and end up looking at pretty extreme stuff very quick. You know how, yeah. how even if you look for books on Amazon.com or something, yeah. all of a sudden, or you, you, you know, you, you, you Google hair dryers and all of a sudden hair dryers are showing up all over every page on yes. the internet. God you know? bless that, by the way. <laughs> it's how I found some of my favorite books in the world. Right. But, <laughs> however, but, however they, they're also tracking your sexual interests and your porn and they're moving you into the, uh, yeah, the slippery the slope. Sides, the slippery slope. <laughs> Theoretically, uh, people can use porn in terms of uh, some porn, depends on the porn. The, it's better if it's in line with your values. It's better yeah, and if your values are for, are for love-based sex. It's better if it shows things that are more in, with that feeling as opposed to the other, let's say, violence. Stick with something that's not going to take you too far from what you believe in. It's not going to make you feel loath, you know, right. loathing with arousal right. or loathing with orgasm. That's not good for us. Or disconnection in a marriage too, right? Because right. that can turn into its own affair. That's how I would define it. I'm curious how you would, having a pornographic interest and then letting that become its own slippery slope. And when you're doing it secretively from your partner, it's its own affair. It's its own divisiveness. And the question that popped into exactly. my mind, does this divide the intimacy does this, or does this create further connection and further intimacy and further being able to express love to, in this case, in my mind, in, with my partner or frankly, with my own self? Those are the kind of questions people need to ask themselves and stay away from material that 
uh, where they're coming up with saying, hey, this is, take, this is lowering my self-esteem. This is taking me farther from my partner. It's upsetting my partner. Hey, it's really someone else's fantasy and my sexuality is being controlled by this commercial product and it's taking me places I don't want to go and it's not worth it, you know? <laughs> and it can also preclude a deepening of sexual intimacy in a, in a, in a partnership where both people may seem like they want to deepen and define what healthy sex is if one partner is going off in a different direction exactly it, it can make that not a possibility for the couple oh yeah and people can sort of feel like disgust about their partners for what they've seen well you know like if i've heard lots of situations where a partner stumbles upon the porn stash of their partner and they go oh my oh god. god you yeah. know oh you know you were looking at teens or you were looking at or barely legals or you were looking at choking and gagging or something mm -hmm. and it's like all of a sudden that's the biggest turn off because of the disparity between what they present to their partner in their experience or even in their imagination versus the right. disparity between what they're also going to outside of the sanctity, I suppose, of, of the commitment to just be sexual with each other, right? Yeah, like I don't like a woman, let's say, or a man saying, I don't want to be with a partner who gets off on strangulation and mm -hmm. sex. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's yeah. like, why? Well, it just said it. It's like, are they thinking that when we're making love? So it can be a big turnoff for intimacy. I think we need to learn to develop our erotic imaginations in other ways, like reflecting back on really good sexual experiences we had with our partner yeah. or dancing in the shower or, you know, creating yeah. images or just looking at our partner's bodies as they become aroused and, and having those kind of images, um, to reference. Yeah. To reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's sexual fantasy in itself is not bad. It's when it, it's what we're using or what we're going to. Yeah, when it becomes more important than relating and relating and, and when it becomes divisive to the relationship, then it's a big problem. When it lowers our self-esteem, like you were saying, you know, for being a survivor, if you found yourself attracted to the fantasies. One of the things there, like I was talking about compassion, and you have to be able to, there's like different techniques. You can, if you're having upsetting fantasies, you can stop. Mm -hmm. Just take a breath, mm -hmm. kind of get back to reconnect with stimulation if it's in self-pleasuring or with a partner. Mm -hmm. You can weave in and out of the fantasy mm -hmm. and just not let it uh, overtake you or, overtake or mm -hmm. be the only thing your, your mind is going to. You mm -hmm. can sort of weaken it a little bit like that over time. Mm -hmm. You can change the dynamics out. Like for me, there had been some inappropriateness with an older male relative and I had been attracted to some fantasies that involved older men and young females mm -hmm. and I just started changing out the age of the men in the fantasies then the yeah, that was always a tough one no. for me to do, to, to, to switch. Like, and you, you write a lot about addressing these, these triggers, and you were talking about maybe going in and out, stopping. One other mm -hmm. element, too, that I love that you wrote about is, is the idea of calming, you know, regulating the nervous system in that moment, maybe becoming aware of any sensation or feelings that are occurring in the body to orient to the present moment. So realizing that if there was some sexual abuse in the past, that my partner across from me may be triggering these memories are triggering this disgust or triggering this aversion, but that my partner across from me isn't, I can't actually assume that this is the case with everybody, but in my case, my partner across from me is not this person when I was 12 years old. Or, And then you were just speaking a second ago about the idea of, of creating a new thought. You know, that's one of the hardest things for me to do or you know, you said lowering the chronological age of someone in, in your in your fantasy. So, or uh, yeah, like the of the perpetrator of the perpetrator, and, and yeah. increasing the age of the victim. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> the, interesting. Of the person that's being done to. So instead of like let's say a four year old with a, with a sixty year old, year old oh, yeah. or something, you end up with <laughs> like more a eighteen year old with a thirty five year old, and then moving it to two people in their twenties. Do you see? Mm -hmm. But but some of the dynamic maybe of somebody initiating someone else or you know the older person initiating the younger person you know you can you kind of play with it and be until you figure out how it 
you can maybe save some of the erotic elements without recreating what's the big the pain term, the the ick factor yeah. yeah the pain and the ick factor the pain. yeah and so and some of what you also write about is the idea that it may be appropriate at times for those survivors who were on who are really committed to this healing journey that taking a healing vacation from sex is an option that you recommend to some people at, at different times. And have you experienced that this can range anywhere from taking a week off to taking years off, you know, without speaking out of school? What, I'm curious about what lengths of time you've recommended this to people through your practice or through your teaching. I recommend it when it's not working to have sex for people. It is when sex is constantly triggering associations to the abuse or when they can't get out of certain patterns of interaction, compulsive behavior, or take a break. It's like a re- you hit the reset button, you know, mm-hmm. and you kind of clean out, clear out, and then you can approach slowly in a way where you can learn the uh it's the, those relearning touch exercises where you learn how to breathe stay present communicate have sex being an expression of fun and uh caring and so it's that reapproach. And I don't see it as a time where you just go, I'm going to avoid sex altogether. It's more like stop certain behaviors that aren't working and then go on a journey of uh, doing different uh, exercises to learn skills to approach sex in a new way. And starting it almost like starting over what we could have been taught or what ideally we would have been taught as young kids as we tiptoed our way through our own maturation process toward what healthy versions of sex are. It's like starting over really in a way. Exactly. And, you know, I was telling you earlier, I put those uh, uh, relearning, the relearning touch healing video on my website for free now. Those are the exercises that are in the sexual healing journey. And you can see it it talks about how these exercises are things like hand clapping routines or the magic pen. They're youthful. Yeah. Yeah. Drawing um, on a part on the partner's back, letter by letter, a message. (laughs) And they sound, yeah. And they move into, you know, the sensual massage um, and there's no nudity in the video, by the way, uh, but there is, uh, it was a real couple who demonstrates exercise, uh, um, that, ha- and there's real caring there. And then you hear from survivors too, who, who, how that it affected them. And the idea too, of, of this healing journey being something that you can do in partnership that, you know, so many times I've yes. heard and, and experienced directly partners just being a little freaked out by, by the thought of having to take on what could feel like a burdensome load of someone's sexual abuse history, you know, and equally my experience in my marriage where it's just a, a journey toward this healing and we're in it together. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not something that I'm having to do in my own time, although, of course, I take responsibility for some of the autonomous work that's appropriate to be done. But but mostly yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's this invitation to heal. And then there's this mutual healing that's been going on with my husband and I, too, that just when we thought it was just me or just when we thought it was just him, you know, oh, lo and behold, we yeah. both have some complimentary stuff going on around it. Even if it's just learned from culture, you know, there's the actual explicit experiences young kids and then there's just the effect that we get from being exposed to culture in general as we touched on earlier and one of the things um, one of the elements of healing for me that's that's been a big piece that I'd love to hear your thoughts on or the idea of moving from having been completely out of my body and dissociated the slow coming back into my body and the different exercises um, I can do on my own and with my partner um, to, to bring awareness back into the body. And one of them that you wrote about, which was so, so lovely, the idea of just even use, using moisturizer, taking your time around your ankles and just really starting in that very slow, tender, kind of non-sexual way of reassociating to the body and becoming more embodied rather than just completely split off in order to, you know, as, in, a, in the childhood version of sexual abuse, we're just having to split off in order to survive it or get through it. Yeah, that reintegrating with a uh, body touch that's safe, um, that's connected. There's there's another exercise I think of with that is like just if if you lay down on a bed and you put 
um, a, a person lays down on a bed and they put one hand over their heart mm -hmm. and one hand over their genitals and they can be wearing clothing it doesn't matter and you just breathe <laughs> it's kind of like mm. you just just do slow breathing you might even listen to some nice music but it's like connecting Link, linking the linking heart linking the heart with the genitals and your emotional feelings and it sounds very simple doesn't it but, but beautiful it, what a yeah. great invitation because it's so we're taught to split them you know that yeah. that the genitals and the sexual experience is devoid of the heart and the heart is its own tender experience but it has you know oftentimes it has nothing to do with sexuality so to be able to right. blend them bring them together is, is stunning and in our a very media laden culture we're getting sort of this stimulation coming into our eyes our visual sphere of looking at these erotic images and then if people are uh, stimulating themselves to that it's like it's like the head and the genitals and right. the hearts the hearts nowhere there, near there they're not right. even in it they're right. like robots you know just like being stimulated by this product and so the the heart's left out we don't, we're losing um or it can make us not very good at being able to associate lead, uh, a lead with our hearts right and, or associate and, a, yeah. a turn on or an arousal with love you know like sometimes mm -hmm. the idea of you know, for me over the years in my own recovery journey, the idea of love and sexuality being linked was almost the opposite of a turn on, you know, it's like, yes, the idea of the heart and love being a big part of it was confusing for me. I just thought, well, I thought they were supposed to be uncoupled and split, you know, so, oh, uh -huh. and so in the healing journey, if you were to recommend, I mean, that's a beautiful recommendation, the exercise you just mentioned of, of the heart, hand on heart, hand on genitals, and just literally staying mm -hmm. there and letting that be its own you know, sense and, and metaphor for the, for the blending. Yeah, it's called heart anchoring, and it's actually described as one of the exercises in the porn trap. It's an offshoot from the relearning touch uh, from the, uh, for survivors. So, so it's something that people who've been affected by pornography can do mm. to, to reintegrate their heart. Um, in, in their sexual and, and just their own body awareness and feeling. Um, so, and, you know, the exercises for people recovering from porn, porn addiction or, you know, over involvement with porn mm -hmm. to, uh, and people who were sexually abused, there's like a lot of overlap there. You yeah. know, it's learning how to be present, learning how to, how to come com back, communicate, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Come home and have, Sexual energy, I think the potential it has is the highest form of expressing our excitement and appreciation and love for another person. Mm. And wow, when two people are feeling that and expressing that through sexual arousal and it's uh, ecstatic, climax, yeah. Yeah. it's ecstatic. I, yeah. it's, you know, it's religious or whatever. It is. No, I mean, that, you, that, you know, that's why people chase orgasm so often, it seems. You know, it's like that chasing God in a way, that experience of the height of light and union. Yes. You know, and orgasm certainly offers that. And that's that's our potential as humans. The bond, the our ability to experience that with a partner helps connect us and bond us. And it strengthens our caring. It strengthens our respect and, and our treasuring of the other person. And that strengthens our families. Mm -hmm. It strengthens our community. So it's just we have this incredible resource that's getting all kind of, you know, like yeah, relegated, <laughs> just based, yeah, confused. Yeah. And it's um, that oxytocin and that's those sweet bonding hormones that can keep us connected. And I, you know, my son is, is never happier than when he sees my husband and I being playful together and connective and giggling and, you know, wrestling. I mean, he's just, you know, the appropriate versions, of course, he's, he's yes. just tickled, you know, he's yes. he a big, big smile on his face. And so another element of the healing um, we touched on it earlier is the idea of being able to set better boundaries slowly but surely. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one as well is the is finding new role models, you know, and so just to give credit to your husband, you know, from for my husband, it was just so lovely for him to meet Larry and to just see see a man who embodies and lives the principles and the ideas around healthy sex and um comfort and, and esteem around all of that, you know, for, for my husband, he, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school, he said this very publicly, but he, it's been hard for him to reference role models 
that that basically live and are mired in the idea of healthy sex and connective sex. So so the idea of us not only searching for these kinds of role models, but also becoming them ourselves for the younger generation, I think is a big deal. Oh, that's so important. And we need, uh, we need people stepping up and, um, you know, being, we need men stepping up and saying, uh, this is uh, what's important in terms of relating with a partner, you know, and, and uh, I think it is happening. Fathers are, you know, talking with their sons and, um, but it, we need. I. We do need more public role models doing that, instead of uh, a lot of the role models you see. Well, you know, are, are acting uh, out. Are acting out. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm thinking about Tiger Woods. I'm thinking about Charlie Sheen. You mm-hmm. know, and, yeah. And the problem, the serious uh, problems he's now has, mm-hmm. and um, sad, very sad. You know, mm-hmm. and but it's sort of like. We've got to get off of this skitzy thing where it's like you're a man if you're if you're aggressive, if you're violent, if you have a lot of sex, if you you know control, if you dominate. If yeah, you, it's so you patriarchal, know, and and for it's, me, it's so entirely off putting. I mean, my husband's very aware now that the hottest man quality that I could think of is is his generosity. You know, okay. when when he comes into the room with, how can I serve? How can I give? you know, how can I, you know, be of value to you, my sweet wife, you know, super hot. I'm just like, oh my God, I'm going to pounce on you. So, you know, that whole, that whole idea of that generosity quality, I I would love for that to overtake the idea of domination or, uh, you know, reductionism where patriarchy just reduces the feminine within their own bodies. You know, it's like somehow macho is the only way to, to appeal to this old patriarchal approach to sexuality. So yeah. if you think of sex as opening yourself to another person fully and being like, you know, being able to reach that, those ecstatic, uh, biological and spiritual experiences with them, that it's, it's possible when you really like the other person, you know, you, you, thanks for all those compliments for Larry. He's all that. He's a, he's somebody that I felt from the start that I just felt so comfortable with mm-hmm. and uh, a different kind of man than I had dated before. We've been together like 40 years, awesome. over 40 years, actually. And uh, we were just Berkeley hippies in a long you're, time And ago. you're so adorable together, by the way. <laughs> and we, yeah, we yeah. met in a <laughs> massage workshop and um, a center, you know, we felt this sort of connection with each other. But it's that as a human being, he's such a good person mm. that I want to get as close as I can to this good person and to know this person. And I'm, I feel safe with him. So yeah. it's like a sense as a survivor, especially of being able to fully open to this person who is just, you know, um, uh, a real good, and he's not perfect, you know, he, I'm not saying, you know, I've got the, you know, I mean, we're, and I'm not perfect. Uh, thank goodness. Neither yeah. Of us thank are. God. Yeah. You know, we got certainly, you know, I, 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 I just cringe at the idea if I was married to myself, what an ordeal that might be. <laughs> that would be just no. so hot. Oh my God. No, I mean, <laughs> but the idea, I mean, you're, you're bringing up some really important topics around and how important Certainly the idea of safety is, you know, because when when it's a context of safety and the sort of exploratory orientation, there's a giddiness and this and it's like starting over, you know, and there's um, it's dipping the toe into areas that you haven't, you know, explored yet. And it's fun. And for me, it elicits this giddiness and this excitement. Um, And also the idea, too, of there being a friendship, you know, for a long time, it was all about high chemistry, get married as quickly as you can, you know, and then, and then start fighting mm-hmm. and then get divorced and just do that, you know, three or four times in your life. That was the old message, you know, and, and the new message is if there can be a friendship that underlies this journey that can be so beautifully challenging and horrifying and, and rewarding and healing, I mean, that, that this, that this friendship underneath it, you know, cause I used to think, Oh God, if there's, you know, my teens, I thought if there's too much of a friendship here, it's not going to be very hot, but that spoke to my sexual abuse and the effects of that. So for me, the idea of being really deeply friendly, you know, with my partner and just being best friends. And then from there, 
um, doing the exploring and the healing and the and the investigating together. It's it's a whole other it's a whole other experience. I mean, it's complete head spinner for me with the history that I've had to to redefine healthy sex and not think of it as oh god, this is going to be really boring and really kind of watered down. And how yeah. am I going to get excited about this? You know. So what would you say to people who who even hear the term healthy sex or a deep friendship and hear these words and think god, there's nothing hot about that? Everybody has their own experiences, but I do take issue with this whole idea that if you get to know someone really well, they become kind of a turnoff, you know, mm -hmm. and that I think that's part of the thing of we need sex is all about novelty and, mm -hmm. and newness. Stim it's stimulation, you know, it's got to be, but I think that can be if we've gotten conditioned to those things, you can also get conditioned to, um, you know, this feeling of being warm and connected and having arousal come from this dance together or rubbing on each other and <laughs> laughing with each other and tickling each other or, um, you know, uh, uh, arousing each other. And, it, and you can have uh, this uh, opening, which I think, I, I feel it has some biological associations with like increased blood flow. When we feel safe, yeah. our blood is flowing. And one of the biggest things uh, in terms of more arousal and more um, uh, presence is when our, we're relaxed enough that our blood is flowing. It's not just this tension, um, tightness. I mean, it, it, sex is so interesting because there can, it can be like a blend of sort of tension and relaxation at the same time, mm -hmm. you know. And, but there's and, a difference between that fun tension and then what I've often associated with sexuality, which is fear. You know, for me, for a long time, unless there was some fear associated, it somehow wasn't a turn on, you know, as opposed to yes. the tension, which is exciting and the release and the dance of that. And what you're speaking to, too, is the idea of the more safety the is, there is, the more the parasympathetic nervous system can have the 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 stomach start to activate the breathing activates there's yes. this openness there's a warmth there's um i just think the the realm of possibilities of of what becomes available to us when we're out of the fight flight freeze collapse thing when we're out of that then there's this warmth and it's like a a starting point you know it's like a sandbox yeah. i used to say like i want sandbox sex like uh -huh. you know the the sex where it's just warm and it's safe and, and yes there's tension but it's not of the fear variety right mm -hmm. oxytocin uh they that bonding chemical can get uh released with cuddling and stroking and um it's a naturally around can be a natural way of getting aroused so you can get that and then you can the the other kind of sex can be this more driven got to get off you know, it's yeah. I think of it a little bit more testosterone driven, but I'm not I don't want to put down testosterone because, you know, actually, I want to sort of encourage it in. Yes. Know? Hail, hail the testosterone. Hail the testosterone. And we the estrogen and know. the progesterone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the oxytocin. We want, we want them all. But, you know, it's. Well, what you were describing to me a second ago with testosterone and the way that you were framing it was more just takey. Yeah. You know, like when, like when some centered, ew, kind of. the narcissistic, yeah, that, that, you know, I don't mind hunger, but when I, you know, over the years, when someone would come toward me with, you give this to me, you know, I would just be like, okay, <laughs> this yeah. is, you know, I get it, but it's not as exciting as like, let's, let's go for it with each other. You know, that's, that was just way more enticing. It's a, and in the long run, to be treated like an object is a very alienating, isolating kind of experience, you know, or to feel compelled to have to service somebody sexually instead of uh, have it be a genuine expression of caring for them and and just loving being close with them. Yeah, and it's taking it out of this sexual objectification thing, too, where... I think you use the word mannequin in your book, like the idea of just, you know, that we're so much more than just, just the aesthetic, just the mannequin that, that has a hole in it to be crass, you know, and that can just be used and taken from and then left in the ditch. I mean, that's, that's me being right. really crass, but I mean, so many times in the past that would, that would be what it felt like as opposed to the healthy version of this, of this sharing and this connection and what's the realm of, of what's possible between two human beings with us getting closer and then pulling apart and getting closer. You know, it's that, it's that undulation of, of, of union 
mendedness combined with with differentiation and coming back and forth so much i mean i feel like that's that's the bliss and the ecstasy of being able to interact with each other in this sexual sacred way Oh, yes, you describe it so well. And I think that's everybody's birthright. I think we all deserve to be able to experience that kind of really profound, regardless of orientation, regardless of gender, you know, uh, uh, or transgender, it doesn't matter. It's it's mm-hmm. a human thing yeah. to, to have that experience of being able to connect uh, like that. And, and it does really... Uh, I'm too much of a grandma, maybe. I don't know at this stage of my <laughs> a life. Sexy but, uh, yeah, sexy, <laughs> sexy, sexy as sexy grandma. As sexy as I could still be, yeah. Uh, uh, and yeah, I don't want to. I don't want it to leave me uh, uh, ever. Yeah, but um, I, you know, I just feel so much for these younger generations, especially the kids with the iPhones and all that. It just and getting there, having a first orgasm while holding an iPhone, looking yeah. at somebody you know being sexually nasty really truly nasty and uh, mm-hmm. disrespectful to someone else it's like ouch you know yeah. you know it's like that those children they deserve to be able to experience this beautiful human connection that that i know for me on my deathbed if i can still think it will be those experiences of profound uh, connection that includes sexuality and it includes, you know, and friendship and intimacy, and, of, all and kinds. intimacy of all kinds that are the most important. And I feel that everybody deserves this. And I'm very, you know, I get, I mean, it's fueled all my work is this mm. feeling like I don't like the unfairness if it's taken away from somebody and they don't you know, they don't get to experience it. Well, God bless you. And and I, I truly believe that your work in the world, you individually and you with Larry together, I just, I'm really deeply moved by this exact, I mean, you're basically inviting all of us to experience what you just said in your last few sentences and, and that it is our birthright and that there's been no better time in history for us to enjoy this sexual, friendly, safe, exploratory, fun playful connection based on the fact that even however many years ago 50 years ago sexuality was not something culturally seen as a way to enjoy you know certain cultures around the planet too it's just seen as a as a procreative act and it's seen as it's just reduced from what from what it portends to be or what it is you know what it what is available to us so so from your from your mouth and your typewriter to god's ears (sighs) and god bless you for your work on a personal level it's affected me greatly in my marriage and and uh and god bless you for how many people you've you've supported in their in their healing from sexual abuse and just just reclaiming sexuality to be the beautiful thing it is so god bless you wendy i'm so grateful to you thank you alanis it's a and it's a pleasure to talk with you Thank you, everyone, for listening. It's a joy to share these podcasts with you. I invite you to subscribe and join me on the next podcast. And until then, take care. I'll see you soon. Conventional kid, all intense.